PowerPoint presentation uh, with you all. Uh, we did uh, we did email this out uh, to everyone last night. So for those folks who were not able to get on uh, the HD meeting and are calling in, um, you should have this uh, PowerPoint in your uh, inbox. So uh, at least you can follow along at home a little bit. Uh, uh, you might not have the exact uh, page numbers uh, uh, lined up, but you, you know, you'll at least be able to get the gist of what we're saying here. So again, uh, thanks for, for being here. My count now is we're up over 80 participants, so that's really great news. Uh, you know, the more, uh, more folks that we have here, the better. Uh, very first thing before we get started, I'm gonna turn it over to Mary just to go over uh, a little bit of housekeeping on uh, the HD meeting process. Yeah, hi. So this meeting is going to be recorded. Uh, we would appreciate it if you would mute yourself. If you're dialing in, you'll need to dial star six to unmute yourself if you have a question. Your, if your bandwidth is creating a problem, please feel free to turn off your video. We don't take offense at uh, not seeing your face. Um, questions are going to be taken at the end of each section. And uh, please feel free to use the chat function to put your questions in there. And our new program assistant, Lily Wallace, is working in the background, and she is going to be uh, keeping track of the chats for us so we can uh, hopefully answer all your questions. Uh, back to you, Joe. Great, thank you, Mary. Um, so yeah, we will uh, follow along with the chats if, if any questions do come up, I have asked, um, folks just to interrupt uh, me or whoever is speaking if there's a particular question that pertains uh, to that section. Um, so just a quick overview of the meeting. Um, you know, we started these uh, meetings last year um, to try to help communities come up with some ideas for community mitigation funds and for projects and so on. Um, and we decided to continue it this year uh, the first thing we'll do is I'll provide just a very brief uh, summary of the Community Mitigation Fund itself. I think most of you have been in this process before, but for those who haven't, it, it will provide a little bit of background for you. Um, and as we do every year, um, we uh, make some modifications to our, our guidelines. Um, and, and 2022 is no different. So we will uh, give a, a summary of what, what's new for 2022. Um, and then we will discuss the individual grant categories. We will go through all of the grant categories just so you know what types of projects fit where. Um, and then for this year, we have, um, we have some folks from uh, Chelsea and Foxborough and Lynn who are going to talk about um, some of the applications that they've done with the Community Mitigation Fund over the last few years. And again, hopefully um, you'll be able to get some good ideas uh, uh, from them, perhaps on, on some of the things you might consider doing for yourselves uh, for the 2022 uh, application. And then after that, we will uh, we'll actually uh, kind of walk through the application form and what the whole process is obtaining the funds. Um, and then I I'm going to discuss this um, new category that we're talking about. It's not included in the guidelines for this year, but we're talking about for future years, uh, called Projects of Regional Significance. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that at the end. Uh, it's not directly pertinent to the 2022 Community Mitigation Fund application, but maybe uh, in years in, in the future. And again, the whole goal of this is we really want to help our communities and other participants, uh, it's not all communities, um, uh, in preparing uh, successful uh, applications. So with that, the Community Mitigation Fund itself, uh, Mass General Law Chapter 23K, uh, which is the Expanded Gaming Act, or as we generally just call it, the Gaming Act, uh, that established the Community Mitigation Fund. And you know the language from the law says, it's to offset the costs associated with the construction and operation of casinos in Massachusetts. So that's always um, one of the things that we have to keep in mind. It's to offset those costs that are associated with the casino. So there has to be uh, 
some kind of link between the impact of the casinos uh, in order to obtain uh, community mitigation funds. Um, so uh, six and a half percent of the gaming taxes from the category one facilities go into the fund and the category one facilities are of course MGM and Encore. And this last point I think is, is very important here. Um, the target for spending for 2022 is uh, $21 million. That is up substantially from what we had available last year. Uh, last year we went out uh, with $12.5 million. And um, you know, part of that reason is um, uh, our applications last year were down uh, quite significantly from 2020. Now, was part of that due to COVID or other uh, uh, factors? Uh, we really don't know exactly. Um, but what that did was because we didn't spend money last year, it rolls over into this year. So we do have a substantial amount of money that is available for grants. So uh, again, we're, we're looking for people to be uh, creative and, um, you know, you know, since there was a lot of money available, we're hoping that we get a good uh, number of grants for this year. And then in red down here, so applications are due by January 31st, 2022, and they have to be submitted through the Combi system. We will talk um, a little bit about the Combi system uh, later on in this meeting, but um, but that's the process that, that, that we must go through. And I think most of the communities are relatively familiar with Combi's. Um, so what's new for 2022? Um, the most significant changes that we have, and we'll talk about each one of these individually, uh, we have uh, some changes to the public safety grants, we also have changes to the community planning grants, and uh, also some changes uh, to the workforce grants. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kate Hartigan to talk a little bit about the public safety uh, grants and the changes that uh, we have for 2022. Sure. Good afternoon, everyone. So nice to see so many people on the call. Um, so as Jill mentioned, there has been um, a rather major change to the public safety grants just in the structure of how the grants will be um, construed um, within the community mitigation framework. This now public safety grants will be their own category for 2022. Previously, public safety grants were a subset of the specific impact grant category, which you recall if you were a prior applicant, um, but they became uh, such a large part of that category that we've set them into their own category for this year. Um, there are no changes to the basic parameters for these grants. Those remain the same. Um, so if you have prior familiarity, um, you'll be fine. Um, it should be noted these funds must be used to supplement and not supplant existing funding um, for your public safety agency. So for example, um, just as a very hypothetical um, example on this particular concept, if if your city, City Hall, has um, cut some portion of your budget, um, say as a police department, um, we can't just replace wholesale that segment of the funding that the city has cut. This will be used to supplant um, some funding that your department already uses. This is a little bit of a nuanced concept. It's referenced in the regulations. If you have questions, you can feel free to reach out to me and my contact information is at the end of the presentation and I'll have a chance to talk to you again a little bit later on um, but so again um, they have to be used to supplement and not supplant existing funding um, the commission is stressing the availability of these grants in this particular year for training in support of the police reform law and some examples of this um, which you may be familiar with are implicit bias training and de-escalation training uh, these would be along the lines of icat training if any of the members of law enforcement agencies are are familiar with that training um, and also crisis intervention training which focuses on uh, police interactions with individuals in mental health crisis so those are just some examples um, of training um, that may be the subject of a grant request by your agency. Great, thanks, Kate. And I think uh, just expanding on, on the training aspect a little bit, we think it's great um, that uh, to, the training, uh, it crosses the boundaries quite easily from community to community. You know, there's, there's probably a pretty good likelihood that the communities, uh, the host communities and the surrounding communities of the casinos uh, particularly police departments and, uh, and probably some of the fire departments as well, would come into contact with patrons or employees of the casino since just such a large volume of, 
of folks are coming to those facilities. So um, we think that training uh, is, is maybe a little bit more broadly based than some of the other, you know, uh, more focused uh, types of, of uh, things that uh, public safety agencies might look for. Okay. Uh, so so Joe, on. there is a Joe, there is a question in in the a couple of questions in the chat about the public safety grants. Um, if we want to look at those now or look at them later. Yeah. Why don't we uh, Why don't we take a quick look? See here. Um, let's see. Do you want me to read it? Yeah. Would you Would okay. you uh, yeah, so okay. this is uh, Northampton is in the process of building a first in the Commonwealth Department of Community Care as part of our police reform effort. Would that qualify under this category? It is in effect a new type of public safety department that is a, a response to the Police Reform Act. Okay, and then one other uh, related to the public safety so that's question one. Two is, does the public safety grant need to explicitly make the tie back to the casino or is training for the force an implicit connection that does not need to be spelled out? Um, so I think on the, on the first point, well, I, I guess on all of them, really, the connection to the casino is an important aspect of that. We can't be funding general municipal purposes so if a, if a connection can be made back to the casino, I think particularly more in the Northampton uh, case, um, it's certainly possible that some funding could be provided, but um, you know, I can't, uh, obviously until we see an application, we can't say absolutely for certain, but there does need to be a, a nexus uh, to the casino. Uh, with respect to the second piece of it, you know, our thought is that, that um, you know, applicants will still need to, uh, show what the impact is. Now, for instance, if, um, if there's a community that's uh, directly adjacent to say MGM, you know, and the original traffic studies for the project show that, you know, 8% of the traffic was going to be going through their community and that, you know, there's a high likelihood that there's going to be some interaction between uh, the, the police or the fire in that community, uh, uh, and, and those uh, patrons or uh, employees that, that are traveling in that direction. I think that's probably enough to, to, to make that case. Um, you know, but there needs, there certainly needs to be some evidence, but it doesn't, you know, it doesn't have to say that, well, you know, we've, we've interacted with 198 people that were at the casino, uh, you know, that kind of detail. We, need, we just need to know uh, in general, uh, sort of what the likelihood is of, um, of that happening. Okay, and there's another question. What is the max request per jurisdiction, i.e. Boston? Also for that max amount, I assume you want it shared between fire, police, and EMS, correct? So the, we will actually get into the, uh, the, the maximum amounts and so a little bit later, but 200,000 is the maximum uh, public safety grant uh, per community. And that would go for any or all of those categories. Um, we have had, uh, communities come in where uh, they've done police and fire. We've had people do police, fire, and uh, EMS. We've had police only. We've had fire only. So uh, it can be any, really any or all of the sort of public safety uh, agencies within a, within a community. Okay. Okay, great. Thanks, thanks for those questions. I think um, that's, that's excellent. Um, just what we want, just what we want to hear is uh, you know people's uh, uh, interest in these. So uh, moving on to the community planning grants, um, this is a category. Uh, just as a little bit of background, um, in this category, or not just in this category, but in general, uh, the, the most difficult thing that communities have had to do is make that nexus to the casino, and uh, in doing that. Um, you know, typically we've required, you know, some, you know, fairly hard data, a traffic study, um, uh, you know, uh, records of, uh, you know, uh, various uh, things to, to try to do that. Um, and that has been difficult for communities. So uh, when we were doing our 
guidelines for this year, we said to ourselves, is there a way that we can try to make, uh, try to lessen the burden on our communities um, to access these funds? So what we did uh, was we went back and we looked at some of the studies that we have done. Uh, you know, we have this uh, robust uh, uh, research agenda and uh, looking at the social and economic impacts of gaming. And we looked at this study uh, that was done out at MGM and it was a patron survey. And one of the questions on that survey asked, well, if you, if you as a patron were not going to go to the casino, would you have spent this money that you spent here on something else? And the term that they use is this uh, notion of reallocated spending. And about half of the people said, no, if I didn't go to the casino, I wouldn't spend this money on something else. But about half of them did say that. And they said, well, I would have probably spent it on a restaurant or other entertainment opportunities, going to the movies or, or going to see live entertainment somewhere. Um, so essentially, and the other thing is that, that our researchers um, said that it's very difficult to quantify that particular reallocated spending and find a particular impact on a given business. So what we did as a commission was that we stated that the presence of a casino likely has some negative impacts on certain local businesses. And if you look at the guidelines, we go into a lot more depth on that. But on the flip side of that coin, we said we also know that the gaming establishments provide um, a lot of opportunities for communities and businesses. Um, you know, things like, uh, you know, the fact that, you know, tens of thousands of people are being brought to the area every day or come to the area every day uh, in the areas of the establishments um, that might not have otherwise been there. And there's thousands of employees who now uh, work and, and play in the local communities uh, uh, around the casinos. So, and, and also the casinos themselves spend uh, tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars uh, a year uh, purchasing goods and equipment. So there are definitely lots of opportunities, but the lack of local funding, you know, most communities aren't, aren't ponying up, uh, you know, $100,000 to do a study uh, to try to identify these things. So that lack of local funding really hurts the uh, community's ability to take advantage of the casino benefits. And we have uh, sort of used this term lost opportunity cost, that by not pursuing these um, potential uh, avenues for the community, that you're losing an opportunity to, to bring new business to your communities. So again, if you see the terms here, costs, we are relating back to that, what came out of the law that says we have to you know, offset the costs associated with a casino. So we're trying to uh, put these in terms of, of costs. So now with that said, um, you know, applicants still need to identify what the impact of the casino is. You don't, you no longer need to go to extraordinary lengths to quantify that impact. Um, and as always, the proposed mitigation uh, must, uh, the proposed project has to mitigate the impact uh, that you define. I mean, for instance, if you say that there's a negative impact on local restaurants, um, you know, your solution to the problem can't be trying to get people to come to local uh, museums. Uh, you know, it has to, one has to go directly with the other. So now that is just in the community planning uh, grant category. Um, and we decided that um, this was sort of the easiest category to, to implement that with. And we'll, we'll see how that works for 2022, and um, then we'll see where uh, where we can go from there. Uh, you know, maybe next year there's another category that we can look at where we can try to uh, implement the same type of uh, of uh, uh, solution to help help communities uh, access the funds. Um, so do we, any questions, have any questions come in, Mary, that we should be? Uh, we just have one residual, again, we, we also understand that crime categories of sex trafficking and sexual assault has become a challenge at the casino and surrounding hotels. Can we apply for funds to mitigate that impact? Um, I guess the shorter answer is you can, you can apply for anything, but, um, uh, you know, it, but yes, last year, um, and you'll hear later on today when 
the folks from Foxborough are in, um, they did apply for a grant to help uh, in that area with some of the hotels in Foxborough. So uh, again, as long as the, the nexus to the casino is made and uh, you know, the argument is made and, and is agreed to by the commission, um, that's certainly uh, uh, an option. Okay, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to um, Crystal, who's gonna talk a little bit about the uh, changes in the workforce uh, grants. Hello. So this year, um, I think the main difference is, you probably would recall if you applied in the past two years, we previously had a supplemental bonus potential that was built in and you could apply one for one of two of those bonuses. We've removed that. Uh, the purpose really is that this streams, it's streamlining the award given we've increased the total amount of the award. So you, you'll notice that we've increased the maximum to 500,000 this year. In previous years, it's been 400, right, Joe? Yeah. yeah. Yep. <laughs> okay, um, I'm not that far removed. But uh, given that we, the max you could achieve with the bonus prior was 500,000, this actually just, it's, it's bumped it up. It makes it a little bit easier. You no longer have to come in with a requirement. Additionally, one of those bonuses required a collaborative application. And in general, the workforce applications already require a consortium approach. So this just streamlines all of that. I think um, those are the two big pieces. Uh, it, they shouldn't really impact anyone, but if you have any questions, um, let me know. Otherwise, we can move on. Great, thank you, Crystal. We, we have another question, which is interesting. Uh, it sounds like funds could not be used to assist with the preparation of a new master plan in a host community. And then another comment is, would that need to stay in the training category or could it apply for investigation and enforcement of sex trafficking and support for those service providers that we would be working with? Um, so the, th those are two separate questions, I'm assuming. Yeah. yeah yep. So the first one regarding um, the master, master planning, um, you know, master planning is typically a more of a general municipal purpose and not uh, particular to um, a casino, although, you know, a, a casino district in, um, you know, in the community would uh, be a part of that. Uh, but I would say in general, master planning is not uh, a, a particular, uh, particularly due to a, a casino related impact. And, and honestly, on the second piece of that, Kate, I, I, maybe you could uh, chime in here. Sure. It's, we're, we're, it's sounding awfully detailed there to really give, yeah. I think, an answer to that question. But Kate, can you uh, sure. weigh so, in on that? Um, I appreciate the question and, and I would invite, um, I don't have the name there, you're just showing up as a number, but you certainly can reach out to me with any more detailed inquiries. But um, just as a kind of a, a, a broad answer, um, you know, training, um, for sex trafficking and human trafficking as it relates back to the presence of hotels that are patronized by patrons of the casino certainly was the basis of an award last year. There was also an award for some equipment, as you'll hear um, from our friends at Foxborough Police, um, that related to um, use and enforcement um, and detection of human trafficking. And so it did tie back to um, the human trafficking and, and some increased um, drug activity present at hotels that were linked to the um, patrons of the casino frequenting uh, the hotels in, in surrounding communities. So um, that's one kind of anecdotal example, but again, I'm happy to have a more detailed conversation um, you know, in, in, in the coming days about any um, questions. That's, a, that's an excellent question. Great, thank you, Kate. Um, so there's a few other changes uh, uh, into the guidelines. We won't go into any great detail here. But uh, the specific impact grant, um, the, the, the maximum value of grants remains 500,000, but we did say that communities can provide more than one application because sometimes there's two different uh, agencies within a community that might be managing grants. Uh, and we understand that sometimes having them split up uh, 
between a couple of different folks makes some sense. Uh, under transportation construction, our, our, our maximum previously had been $1 million. We've increased that to 1.5. We've heard from our communities that construction costs are going uh, through the roof, so uh, we, we did increase that. Um, and also we will, uh, the review team will now consider the use of minority women and veteran businesses as an evaluation criteria. Uh, we're not establishing our own goals, uh, but we do want to understand what uh, communities would be doing with respect to that. You know, if they're doing a, if they're hiring a consultant to do a study, uh, you know, will there be any participation from minority women or veteran owned firms, that kind of thing. And then also on all of our application forms, we're asking that the grant requests be rounded to the nearest hundred dollars. We're, we're trying to get rid of those grants that are $87,342.27, uh, you know, that kind of thing. So uh, we're just asking uh, that you round up to, to the nearest hundred. Okay, so the individual categories, um, there are eight categories in our, our guidelines, and I'm not gonna talk about these last two, the Tribal Gaming Technical Assistance Grant and the Emergency Mitigation Grant. Those are, um, the, the Tribal Gaming Grant is only gonna come into, uh, into play in case uh, there's any movement with the uh, Wampanoag uh, Casino, proposed casino in Taunton. And the emergency mitigation grant would be something that would happen outside of our normal cycle that we're in right now. So not, it's not really uh, pertinent. So uh, just quickly going through the, the categories and what's included. Um, so the specific impact grant, essentially uh, at this point, since we've created all of these other categories of grant, this is something that if it doesn't fall in any of the other categories, it would go under specific impact. So this is something if a, a community finds an impact and defines it and, and comes to us to, to, to mitigate and it doesn't fall within one of our other categories, uh, then it would be within uh, the specific impact uh, category. Now, some of these things you see here, these are things that are identified in the law, uh, increased demand of water and sewer systems, impacts from stormwater runoff, stresses on housing stock, increased social service needs, uh, Im demonstrated impact on public education, um, you know, these are things that have not really come into us before. But anyways, uh, you know, so that this category will be something that really, if it doesn't fall in any other category, this is where it should go. Um, and so public safety grants, turn this back over to Kate to talk about uh, uh, the public safety grant uh, a little bit. Um, so uh, with regard to this particular category, again, its own category this year, um, a qualification for a public safety grant will come for communities um, that can show an impact by a gaming establishment that has been identified uh, by a community that requires, for example, supplemental training for police, fire, or emergency medical services for handling patrons from the gaming establishment that may filter into your communities, an increased demand on public safety staffing, um, and you could review the um, awards from the prior years to see an example of this in the Everett Police Department adding some targeted patrols during um, the early morning hours after um, the close of alcohol service at the casino. Um, that was approved um, in a prior year, so that would be a good example available to review um, on the Gaming Commission website. Also, increased demand on public safety equipment. Um, if you are having uh, more uh, frequent use of your, say, um, you know, a custody vehicle you're using to transport um, detainees from, um, you know, your establishment over to court and you can prove, a, a you know, a, an increase uh, that's related back to patrons from the casino entering your community. Um, that potentially um, is a qualification and also any pedestrian safety improvements. And there are several examples as well on the website of prior grants that were successful. Um, again, as Joe mentioned, and um, as was asked in the chat, there is one public safety grant per community, but that can be shared among a combination of um, services, including police, fire, and EMS. The maximum grant is $200,000. There is a waiver provision in the regulations, and I'd invite people to review that um, in more detail in the regulations, and certainly you can reach out to me with any questions on that provision. And again, that public safety funding request must supplement and not supplant existing funding. And, and um, again, I welcome questions on that. In terms of the nexus, which uh, Joe briefly discussed, again, proving a nexus here as it connects to training, um, 
if you are having an impact in your community that is based on um, an influx of people who came you know, from the casino and into your community, um, that's an example of where you may be able to draw a nexus by relying on um, you know, perhaps some baseline statistics you have or some anecdotal evidence um, you have, um, you know, that's being reported into by your patrol staff. Uh, so uh, those are just some examples of how you can draw that access with relation to training, which again is a particular emphasis um, and within the guidelines for this particular category this year. Great, thanks Kate. Um, so the next category, the community planning grants, we talked about this a little bit before on the changes we made, but you know, these uh, grants are typically uh, are used to try to leverage uh, the presence of the, the casino, the gaming establishment for the benefit of the community um, and things that we've done in the past, economic development studies, we've done land use planning, uh, so marketing plans, promotional plans, tourism plans, things of that nature. Um, and then some of the other things that communities have done is uh, to create training programs for local businesses to, um, to try to help them better compete for business at the casino. Um, so things like that, they're all, all, all good stuff. Um, and uh, again, I think by uh, making the hurdle a little uh, lower uh, to this, we should uh, hopefully uh, be able to see some good applications in this category. Again, maximum grant is $100,000. Um, and we do ask uh, that folks consult with their regional planning agency on some of these things. Um, um, and also not particularly mentioned here, but, and we mentioned it later, but, you know, collaboration with other communities. You know, if, if someone was uh, considering to doing, you know, a marketing or a tourism plan, sometimes two or three communities working together might have a little bit more uh, bang for the buck or might have a, a further reach than, than maybe a single community doing it. So we always do encourage that. Um, and the transportation planning grants, uh, we've done many of these, and these are typically for traffic studies or preliminary design. Uh, we've done some for transit planning. We've looked at some options for to provide bus lanes, and we, we actually looked at an option to extend the Silver Line. Um, uh, bike path planning, uh, that is something we've done quite a lot of uh, by, and design. Um, we've done um, particularly a, a lot of work in the, in the community's neighboring um, uh, Encore. There's uh, quite a bike network there, and, and, and we have actually provided a lot of uh, design and uh, construction funding now uh, towards those those efforts. So again, the maximum grant amount is two hundred thousand dollars, and also, again, particularly with traffic studies, uh, a consultation with your regional planning agency uh, should happen to make sure that that um, you know you're working within. You know, I mean, the uh, the local planning agency might have some studies that have already been done, or or this may uh, your work may uh, piggyback onto some of the things that have been done previously. Joe, we have a couple of questions. Sure. Is there any data that can be shared from MGM Casino as to where the visitors are coming from? If a local city could show that a good number of residents visit the area casino that could help explain the impact on public safety or infrastructure? So that is a very good question. Um, I think some of their information, you know, they have shared some of their information with our researchers um, to do some of our studies, but I think the particular information um, is uh, maybe guarded under their non-disclosure agreement. You know, everything in these studies gets anonymized, um, but, um, you know, we'll give you some links to all of those, th those research, uh, the research agenda, um, studies that have been done. And I, I'm trying to remember, I think on this uh, uh, patron survey, I think we also did a license plate survey, but it was really to primarily define Massachusetts versus Connecticut versus Rhode Island, that kind of thing. Um, so I'm not sure that that data is directly available or, or frankly would be made available. Okay, uh, next question is, Please, and this is, I'm going to combine the two. Please explain about consultation with RPA. What specifically does that mean? Can you explain the details of consulting with planning agencies? 
Yeah, so um, the regional planning agencies, uh, primarily there's the Pioneer Valley Planning Council uh, West, and there's the Metropolitan Area Planning Commission in the East. And what we're suggesting, particularly if you're doing um, mostly on, on traffic studies and things of that nature, um, uh, you know, just giving them a call and telling them about your project a little bit and seeing if they have, you know, they may have done something that was very similar to that or otherwise. Um, and often they're very interested in, uh, you know, what communities are doing and they may be able to partner you up with another community or something to that effect. So we just want you to have a conversation with them, let them know what you're thinking and just get their input and just share that with us on, on what on what their thoughts are. Okay. How would an applicant tie a tourism plan as opposed to a specific impact on businesses back to the impacts of a casino? Well, I think, you know, the notion here is that a tourism plan, you would, you would want to be targeting um, patrons uh, and perhaps employees of the gaming facilities to try to encourage them to come to your community. So in the past, we've done we've done some uh, tourism, uh, a couple of communities did some tourism videos and they actually, uh, the, um, the casino agreed to you know, run those in the, in the hotel rooms uh, and so on. So when someone comes to their hotel, they see that, uh, you know, hey, nearby we've got, you know, these other amenities that we could go visit, um, that kind of thing. So the connection to the casino was really the trying to attract uh, probably casino patrons uh, to your community. It's not really just for a broad tourism plan. Uh, just in general, it would have to be a bit more targeted. Okay, so uh, transportation construction grants, as we as we talked about before, we've increased the maximum amount to one point five million dollars, and uh, the maximum uh, gaming commission contribution per project is one third of the total project cost. So if you had a four and a half million dollar project, we would pay the 1.5 million. If you had a $3 million project, we'd pay a million. So the maximum is 1.5, but any for something smaller than four and a half million, our contribution would be one third of the cost. And also these projects need to be shovel ready by the end of June, 2023. So we would issue this grant uh, by the end of June 2022, um, and um, and we would give you a year to get that design finished and have it ready ready for construction. Um, and again, similar here, we want you to uh, consult with the Mass DOT or your regional planning agency, uh, depending upon what's appropriate. Um, you know, on some of these projects, um, and you'll hear from Chelsea in just a few minutes. Uh, you know, they cobbled together a bunch of sources of funds where Gaming Commission was just one piece of it. So that required coordination amongst a bunch of different entities. And if anyone is planning on building anything like what we have in this picture here, uh, we don't have enough money for that. Um, and then, again, we talked about, we talked about a little bit earlier on regional collaboration, while not a sp specific category. In the transportation planning and community planning categories, if more than one community works together, there are some regional, there are some bonuses for regional collaboration from, they vary from 10 to $50,000. So if you work with a neighboring community and um, you, know, you each could get a $200,000 uh, uh, transportation planning grant, uh, you could get up to 250, you could get up to $450,000 if two communities combined and got the, the uh, the, the bonus for regional collaboration. So we've had a number of cases, Foxborough, Plainville and Rentham work together, Revere and Saugus have worked together a few times, Springfield and Chicopee uh, work together on one project, and Everett and Somerville have uh, worked together quite, quite a bit. Um, okay, so workforce development, I'm gonna turn this back over to Crystal. Thanks, Joe. So workforce grant applicants uh, to the Community Mitigation Fund should propose to remedy impacts tied to the casino that may alleviate challenges due to educational robots, training and upskilling, um, inequities and in access to jobs in the industry, resource strains, alleviating general industry challenges to the employment pipeline. 
So as a reminder, the max grant amount for this application year is 500,000 and applicants really do need to use a consortium approach when they apply. All of that will be addressed as you go through the application itself. Some costs uh, and activities are listed on this slide that we have um, traditionally approved. A reminder that administrative costs included in the budget cannot be more than seven and a half percent. But consulting services, uh, reasonable expenses um, to the program, materials, training tools, uh, exams, technology, books, uh, last year, um, tools and materials included um, MyFi's because of the changes to, during the pandemic with students needing to be online. Um, personnel costs with certain restrictions have been approved. In general, um, what people think of for workforce tends to be the um, adult basic education, the GED assistance, and programs of that nature. Those are certainly a key part of the workforce uh, applicants we've received in the past. Um, other ideas and improved elements um, are welcome. We'd really like to make sure you're integrating a host of opportunities for individuals at various levels of readiness for the industry's workforce. Um, that could include interview prep, especially with a digital focus um, since the pandemic, a lot of online interviewing has come to play. Uh, resume writing and evaluations have uh, certainly been considered in the past. Certifications are often a big part of this. A lot of people might think OSHA or TIPS, but uh, we've uh, approved customer service gold in the past or any other industry certifications that may really give a applicant a leg up. Um, general digital literacy, I think I mentioned. Um, specific programming, including contextual training is also allowed. Um, English for hospitality training has happened. Culinary training and hotel training are certainly industry related. Um, but thinking outside the box a little bit, their uh, counting training, such as positions for our, uh, We've, we've looked at banking training in the past, which can relate to our cage um, positions in the casinos. Gaming schools are a little less applicable now, but at the time in the past, there were some scholarships and direct interviews in the pipeline really tightened up that application. So considering how those pieces may come together. The programming components do not have to be just training, but you can think recruitment, marketing um, tools, trainers and instructors. Uh, another example might be bus tokens. We've, we've seen that in the past, you know, um, considering how we're trying to get our applicants programming, making sure that people can actually get to these programs as well. So you can think in that context as, as far as you need to make sure the program is well-rounded. Some questions that have come about, I'd say in the last year or the last few months specifically to me, I can just address right now. Uh, programming related to security and surveillance training, yes, uh, if you can figure out a way of doing that and working with that, that certainly could be part of your application. Um, can you focus on a specific role or position? Yes, if you can support that the casino is really struggling to get the workforce into those roles. Um, one particular question came about the slot supervisor and whether there might be a way to develop some apprenticeship. Certainly, I would love to, would love to consider that um, as long as you're working together to make sure that that's developed well and that you also have um, the support of the casinos who would be able to pipeline that apprenticeship. Um, English programming, of course. Uh, English is, is certainly a key element to a lot of these positions and um, if you could develop a particular curriculum or there is a curriculum developed that can definitely be part of the application. Just want to reiterate that you have to ensure that collaborative planning within your, re your region and the educational components but as well as with the casinos licensees themselves. Um, I just got a question yesterday about daycare, daycare challenges. Certainly if you can figure that out we'd love to consider that. That's a always been addressed as an issue um, 
a really challenging issue to overcome though. And transportation hurdles are also a yes. Crystal, so, I have a question for you. Yeah. Uh, does the workforce development has to be related with the job that the casino have, or can it be training in high demand jobs, AKA STEM related jobs? Okay, that's a great question. I was actually about to address that a little bit. Um, in the past, the, the, this is the biggest challenge, I think. You have to make the direct connection and provide supporting evidence that this will impact, has impacts directly related to the casino. Now, what that means is a little different. It's constantly changing, right? So when Encore was opening, the main connect was the direct impact to the, lo uh, the local hotel and restaurant industry. So making that connection, that backfill was impacted. Um, people were programming a little bit more focused on the hotels and the restaurants, not just on what casino jobs there were. Of course, there are restaurants and hotel jobs at the casinos. Um, but with people shifting out of certain industries and into the casinos at a heavy level, that would, there was support there to show that. It's been challenging to show that, for example, in we, we received in the pandemic um, some inquiry as to whether we could fund hospital jobs or other industries where you know, you're saying STEM here. Now, now, math is certainly related to some of the casino jobs, but you have to somehow show that this is going to be beneficial to the casino workforce as well as the local industry, local workforce. Um, we couldn't really see how exactly those hospital pipeline programming, us funding that, was coming from the casino piece. Although there was a good argument made for the fact that while they couldn't work at the casinos, some of those individuals from the casino workforce were now looking to get into other jobs. If you can make the connection and, and support that and show us that, we'll certainly consider it. Um, Joe, I don't know if you want to add to whether STEM, I guess that's the answer, <laughs> is yeah, you have I mean, to show the connection. Right. I mean, if, if, if a reasonable connection can be made, um, you know, I mean, if they're if they're in their facilities department, can't find any help and, and, and need, you know, trained people who can run HVAC systems and other things, you know, um, uh, then, then and that, that's fine. Um, you know, STEM, you know, engineering, other things. I mean, they do have some need for engineers at a facility like that, but th there really needs to be a demonstrated need at the facility. And we know, I mean, you can just go online to the MGM website or the Encore or the, or the Plainville rep website, and the things that they're looking for are, you know, uh, cocktail servers. They're looking for uh, right. food and beverage. They're looking for housekeeping. They're looking for sort of all of those hospitality-related type things, and then some. Then some like banking type operations, mm -hmm. age, and 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 so on. So I mean, it's not simply hospitality. But if there are not, uh, if there's not a substantial number of folks uh, looking for work in that area, I think we would be a little bit hard pressed to try to. Right. The funding. general, the general challenge in um, some of our workforce applications or inquiries in the past has been that they focus on them being workforce development to the local community, as opposed to remembering that these these are funds directly from the casino and have to be related to the casino. Now there are. There have we, things have changed over time. One of those examples I said before, when we shift to the pandemic um, Zoom mentality, that really required a lot of tech tools and digital literacy that some of our programs didn't have and our, and our the individuals they were serving just didn't have the access that they needed. And so then the funding mechanism supported being able to have the programming online. So that required um, approving materials and tools, tech tools that we hadn't approved in the past. As we know, the hospitality workforce is experiencing really different um, challenges right now. So your application could resonate with those impacts. You just have to make the direct connection to the casinos and stuff. Yeah, and, and we've always said that, especially when the casinos first opened, we knew that there was going to be lots and lots of hiring at those facilities and that they would be taking people away from those other jobs and certainly 
training people to backfill those jobs we felt definitely made sense. That probably isn't as pertinent today as it was exactly. uh, back then when they first opened. Yeah, when five or 6,000 people were migrating from one to the other. Right. So like I said, it, it has um, changed over time how you can align this application, but that is a key component of a successful application. All right, great. Um, so let me just stop here for, I'm going to just stop sharing for just a minute um, before we get on to part, our next part. If we have any other questions to answer on sort of that whole first piece of the uh, presentation. Yeah, Jill, there was a question for transportation construction grants. Are these reimbursement grants and do they involve mass DOT review or construction management? Um, we can structure the payments on these pretty much any way a community needs to, but most communities have done them as a reimbursement. Uh, money spended, expended up front, we get uh, uh, payment estimates periodically and then we make our payments. Uh, typically, they do not require uh, MassDOT involvement. Um, you, know, I, you know, some of these projects uh, might be TIP projects, but others may not be. Um, one we, we did with the, the uh, city of Springfield, that was just a purely local project. And you're gonna hear from uh, Chelsea coming up, but uh, there was no mass dot involvement, I don't think in their project. Uh, I could be wrong on that. Um, but uh, they certainly didn't go to mass dot for funding on that project. So, so no, not necessarily, um, but it's certainly, we could supplement funds um, if there were insufficient funds you know, available uh, on a project that was being funded by MassDOT uh, or uh, a standalone project. Okay, any, anything else, Mary? No, I don't see any more. Okay, and um, all right, so why don't we move on? I'm gonna go back to sharing and we'll move on to our next uh, section which is um, we're going to have uh, uh, Alex Train, uh, the Director of the Housing and Community Development Department in uh, Chelsea, and Ben Cares, who's a, a Senior Planner and Project Manager uh, uh, in the Department of Housing and Community Development. They're gonna do a presentation on their uh, Beecham and William Street uh, Improvement Project. So Alex and Ben, take it away. Thank you, Joe, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, before we dive into our project this afternoon, uh, the city wants to extend our gratitude to all of the commissioners and the Mass Gaming Commission for their persistent support of the mitigation of casino impacts and just generally approaching this through a, a collaborative uh, you know, partnership. It's been something that, uh, as many of you know, is a rarity with a lot of state agencies, so we've been very pleased to be able to uh, Sort of join in lockstep to, to work on some of these issues with the commission. Uh, so my name is Alex. I'm the director of housing and community development for the city of Chelsea, and I'm joined by Ben Cares, who's our senior planner and project manager, who's responsible for the city's infrastructure um, agenda. Um, so for folks that uh, aren't from the Boston area, um, the city of Chelsea is in close proximity to Encore Casino, um, which is situated in the city of Everett. Um, throughout the course of the last three to four years, the city of Chelsea has collaborated with the city of Everett on the design of infrastructure improvements on many of the major arteries that connect the two communities. Um, so we have been able to focus squarely on the Beach and Williams corridor. Um, if you go to the next slide, we can kind of talk through the lineage of the project. Uh, so the Beach and Williams Corridor is a major freight arterial that connects Logan Airport in East Boston, Chelsea, and Encore Casino in Everett. The corridor bisects the New England Produce Center and a concentration of food distribution and industrial uh, land uses, as well as densely populated residential neighborhoods. So if you're arriving in Boston via Logan Airport and taking a taxi over to the casino, or if you're embarking towards the casino from a point on the North Shore, you're more likely than not taking the Beach and Williams Corridor in order to reach Encore. Um, so in identifying this kind of geographic uh, travel pattern back in 2016,
2019, we applied for commission funding through the Community Mitigation Fund to conduct a transportation corridor study. Initially, we set out to answer the question of, you know, what will the impacts be to this corridor? And how can we, through a series of robust infrastructure enhancements, uh, mitigate and control for those impacts? Uh, so that study was done in conjunction with Stantec, an engineering firm, and we were able to both conduct a detailed traffic analysis as well as put forth conceptual design alternatives that re envisioned the Beach and Williams corridor as a multimodal uh, corridor. If you go out there today, and since I was a kid, the Beach and Williams street area has no sidewalks, it's devoid of any pedestrian amenities, it's inherently unsafe, and conditions have rapidly deteriorated. Uh, these physical conditions have declined since the casino opened, and we were through the study, we're able to propose interventions to preserve and enhance the functionality of the road. Uh, so once that study was published, we put forth a preferred alternative that originated from that careful analysis. Again, we applied in 2018 for commission funding to begin a design and engineering process uh, that culminated with a design of utility and streetscape enhancements to revitalize this derelict corridor. As we were designing this project, we recognizing the immense cost of the effort, we're actively searching for sources of funding to finance the reconstruction effort. Um, as part of the financing package that Ben will outline later on, we were able to secure two grants in 2020 from the Mass Gaming Commission that played a vital role in ensuring the project's viability. Uh, next slide, please. So the Beach and Williams Corridor is a lateral arterial that connects Chelsea to Everett. Um, on the left-hand side of the map, you can see Encore Casino denoted. And the run between Encore Casino and Logan Airport goes right through the heart of this industrial district in Chelsea. But through the study, you know, we engaged a professional consultant to both analyze patterns of traffic assess safety deficiencies, and put forth recommendations of operational improvements that we could implement through a robust program of, of infrastructure improvements. Not only was this focused on vehicular traffic, but it was also focused on pedestrian safety, bicyclists, as well as freight movements, as many vendors serving the casino traverse the Beach and Williams corridor in order to make deliveries and conduct business. Uh, next slide, please. And some of these snapshots from the study, you know, include an in-depth analysis of intersections, many of which were identified as being outmoded and unable to sustain the increase in traffic affiliated with the casino, as well as a breakdown of employee trip patterns, as well as resident trip patterns and their nexus with the casino. In Chelsea, the majority of residents currently drive alone, but many of them are reliant on public transit, with almost a third of our residents not owning a personal vehicle. This is juxtaposed against the employment or the employee trip patterns that are seen today, including the fact that almost three quarters of the folks that are employed at the casino are reliant on vehicles. So we immediately knew that with the opening of the casino, new trip generation would trigger traffic, operational issues, and, and congestion that had to be mitigated. Uh, next slide. And so concurrent with the design process, the casino was slated to open. So before we concluded the design, in order to both optimize our design for intersections and the general corridor, as well as to truly gauge the impacts of the casino, we undertook a rigorous data collection and analysis process to demonstrate the impacts the casino was having on the local roadway network. So about six weeks prior to the casino opening, we hired a traffic engineer to collect traffic data in two locations that were identified for particular reasons. One location was identified in order to capture trips that were originating from Route 1, the major state highway serving the North Shore, connecting in with the casino, 
and a second location on Williams Street that would be able to capture traffic originating from Logan Airport and heading to the casino. It took about six weeks of baseline data to establish kind of normal conditions pre-casino opening. And then we also collected data for a number of weeks after the casino opened. You know, understanding that usually with the openings of these types of facilities, there's an immediate peak before conditions normalize. We let conditions wind down to some extent and return that October following the casino opening to take another round of data collection um, in order to ascertain the impacts on the traffic network. And throughout this analysis, you know, we found an average daily traffic increase of about 19% that was correlated to the casino. However, this was particularly pronounced on weekends, such as Saturday evenings, when we saw an 89% increase in traffic, as well as during the day on Saturday, when we saw a 39% increase in traffic. Quantifying these traffic increases allowed us not only to hone our design, but it was also conducive to our collaboration with the Mass Gaming Commission, since we had concrete data that could demonstrate impacts and quantify you know, what the city of Chelsea was experiencing as a result of the facility. Uh, next slide, please. And so with that, I'll turn this over to uh, Ben, our senior project manager, who will talk through the design and construction process. Thanks, Alex. Uh, so, you know, with our sort of work with Stantec and then a separate engineering firm, firm TEC, uh, we sort of culminated uh, sort of our findings into a design process uh, to sort of get at basically a construction package and an implementation program uh, for the project. And so, um, again, you know, the sort of planning and design processes were, were funded through some Mass Gaming Commission uh, financing. Um, and so sort of culminating all of those things together, we addressed a lot of the issues that were sort of being drummed up by those analyses. Um, and so for the proposed corridor-wide improvements, uh, we had a pretty specific focus on sort of um, pedestrian safety. Um, as Alex had alluded to previously, you know, this is a major corridor, obviously, for vehicular traffic. Um, but with the creation of many jobs sort of at the casino um, within the city of Everett, um, there are also other sort of, uh, you know, vulnerable populations as well as workforce populations that utilize the corridor in a non-vehicular fashion uh, to bike and to walk to work. Um, and so thinking about improvements for the surface elements for this uh, this corridor, um, a lot of our suggestions sort of culminated to some of those safety features. Um, and uh, sorry, I got distracted by the chat. Um, so it helped us to sort of guide that design process and sort of utilizing that data and, and building on some of those narratives. Next slide, please. Uh, we also wanted to sort of showcase that we did a pretty rigorous community engagement and stakeholder engagement process throughout the design. Um, obviously, when we're utilizing funds from uh, the Mass Gaming Commission um, and sort of thinking about the casino and, you know, the impacts, yes, to communities through the establishment of a casino, um, but also thinking about sort of uh, what the impacts might be for the local economy, um, as well as sort of individuals located adjacent to the corridor, witnessing, you know, potential increases in traffic, um, but also for residents that may or may not be employed at the casino or traveling to and from the casino, we wanted to include them all in the, in the conversation. Um, and so we felt that it was important to sort of demonstrate to both our grantors um, but to our community that, you know, the use of these funds uh, would be sort of an inclusive process and an inclusive design process. Next slide, please. And so the design process through sort of stakeholder engagement, community engagement, and then working with our engineering consultants um, did culminate to sort of suggestions uh, of sort of, uh, you know, pedestrian safety. Um, the upper two pictures are actually uh, precedent images for sort of, uh, uh, concrete sidewalks in industrial areas, as well as shared use pathways. Um, and then the bottom two images, the one on the bottom left is actually our brand new sidewalks here on the Beachman William Street corridor. Um, we had to be sure when we were looking at sort of the financing breakdown for the construction process uh, that we were utilizing the Mass Gaming Commission funds for elements like sidewalks and surface features that help to address some of those pedestrian and multimodal concerns that we had, especially with increases to traffic um, and sort of the functionality of intersections. The bottom right is showcasing a sort of 
a cross section of what will be the Beachman William Street corridor. Um, we'll be tying up construction this spring and summer, um, and that is a shared use pathway uh, that sort of 11 and a half to 15 feet sort of asset there, um, which will help to connect both uh, municipalities, Chelsea and Everett together, um, but will also sort of connect into sort of broader considerations of multimodal connections to and from Everett to Chelsea and to and from uh, the casino itself. Next slide, please. Um, and so, you know, our project, the implementation of our project would not be possible without the Mass Gaming uh, Commission and, and sort of their finances uh, and the, the grant program that they've been administering. Um, we did indeed have to cobble together a considerable amount of financing from other resources, um, but most specifically the Mass Gaming Commission funds were utilized for those surface features and addressing those key concerns that were uh, brought up through the design and planning process as well as sort of our engagement processes here. So um, for those of you that are sort of considering financing for, uh, uh, you know, considerable um, considerably high cost infrastructure projects uh, for for sort of reference our project cost was 11.26 million um, and so we were able to put together financing from the US Economic Development Administration through a grant program as well as MWRA I and I fi financing uh, Eversource uh, and local financing um, and so, you know, carefully tracking all of these expenditures within the construction program is something that's really important. Um, if you're considering utilizing Mass Gaming Commission financing, um, you need to make sure that you're prepared to sort of track all of the expenditures throughout each of those uh, elements of your project that you applied for. Um, so you can see that, you know, with a project like the Beachman William Street Corridor, you have utility improvements, um, but the Mass Gaming Commission uh, financing is specific being routed towards those surface features and so we showcase that in sort of our reports to the Mass Gaming Commission. And with that I believe we'll turn it over to questions um, and we just wanted to thank the Mass Gaming Commission um, for allowing us to present on this project today for the considerable financing that you've granted to our project um, and for your sort of boots on the ground uh, coordination with us and uh, the site visit that we uh, got this picture uh, taken at so thank you. Well, thanks, Ben and Alex. Uh, great presentation. Uh, Mary, we have any questions? Coming yes, we do. Um, while we're talking transportation, we have one. Is design fee eligible for transportation construction grants? Um, no, th that would be under the transportation planning grants. So design funds would typically come under transportation planning grants uh, under the construction. Now, we, we will allow for some construction administration under the transportation construction, but um, not, not particularly for design. With regard to public safety grant, are you saying that anything we would do would need to be a need to be training regardless of topic area? No, no, um, there, there's, there's multiple things that can be funded under public safety. Uh, the commission is just merely highlighting training this year uh, due to the, uh, the, the police reform law and some additional uh, training requirements. And so it's something that the commissioners uh, feel strongly that we should be uh, financing, but that's, um, uh, but that is certainly not the only uh, uh, type of thing. It, we, equipment can be purchased. And again, additional, if there's additional uh, things that the police departments need to be doing or fire or, or EMS, um, due to the casino, some of those things can be funded as well. Okay, good. That's it. Okay, well, thanks, uh, Alex and Ben. That's that was great. Um, so I'm gonna gonna ship. We'll ship right over uh, to the uh, town of Foxborough. Uh, Foxborough has gotten a couple of public safety grants from us. Uh, they were, of course, uh, specific impact grants in the last couple of years, but uh, were for public safety. And we have with us uh, Lieutenant Ken Fitzgerald from the Foxborough Police Department. And I'll uh, turn it over to Ken. Thanks, Joe um, and Mary and everyone at the Gaming Commission. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Ken Fitzgerald. I'm a uh, police lieutenant here in Foxborough. Um, I had never written a grant before I did the uh, first Gaming Commission grant we wrote uh, two years ago. 
and somehow I've now become a grant writer. So <laughs> those of you who may choose to do this, be careful what you wish for. Um, I will say this, the gaming mission is very uh, easy to deal with. It's a very straightforward grant. It's not like dealing with some of the federal uh, uh, DOJ grants and uh, the hiring, the cops hiring grants and the um, Homeland Security grants, some of those things that are pretty daunting uh, to deal with and with the expenditures. It's very straightforward, very easy. Um, and this first slide is just a picture of, uh, this is a vehicle we got uh, last year with uh, some money from the Gaming Commission. Uh, next slide, please. So in uh, last year's grant, uh, we had asked for uh, some traffic safety equipment and uh, we were awarded over $80,000 with that money. We bought that uh, pickup truck that was seen before. Um, at the time we had nothing that could tow our uh, big trailer full of equipment like cones and barricades and things around. We got a new smart uh, radar messaging board unit that you can, uh, it can be towed around and deployed, say road closed or put an arrow up or any other programmable messages um, and some new traffic cones, barricades, things of that nature um, for traffic safety issues. Uh, next slide. In this last year, uh, we changed focus on the grant a little bit. Uh, we did get another vehicle um, and I know we had, uh, there was some talk about the human trafficking, sexual exploitation, that sort of thing. And this is how some of it ties in and I'll get to how I got there in coming slides. But uh, we did get a new unmarked soft vehicle, a non uh, police looking vehicle for uh, some plain clothes and undercover um, uses. Uh, we got a good amount of money for training and uh, that was broken down into three categories, uh, human trafficking, implicit bias, and crash investigation and reconstruction. I will tell people who, uh, law enforcement folks who are looking for grants, it's tough to, with the training, because we don't know what's coming out next year. At the time I wrote this grant, implicit bias was, there was a lot of one day implicit bias classes coming out. Uh, it was just after, um, the George Floyd riots and uh, a lot of the real big national police reform type talk and those classes were everywhere. Fast forward six, eight months, the grant process goes through, we get awarded the money, the classes all go away because they've been rolled into in-service. So when you're writing the grant, don't pigeonhole yourself uh, with just one topic, kind of cast a broad net because law enforcement training, it's still a for-profit business and you don't know uh, what's going to be included in next year's in-service run by the state versus what the private vendor is going to be out there running. Um, and I'll talk about how I got to these things uh, as we go forward here. But uh, human trafficking, uh, implicit bias, and crash investigation are all things that we're able to tie a correlation to the casino. Um, next slide. So when preparing the grant, um, here's some of the resources that we used. Uh, one of the easiest things for any law enforcement agency is your department statistics, your computer dispatch, and your records management. Um, I know Boston is on here, and the same kind of situation we have, your record software, your Mark 45 is different, 43 is different than Hexagon dispatch software. So our dispatch records hold a lot of information, but then our records management holds a lot of information too. So we had to look in both those places to um, find some numbers for traffic accidents, for motor vehicle stops, uh, traffic complaints, uh, issues at hotels, issues at some of the businesses along Route 1 uh, that leads right to Plain Ridge. I know I didn't mention that earlier. We, Foxborough's next to Plainville and Plain Ridge is the casino that's closest to us. It's about two miles down Route 1. Uh, there's some state statistics. When last year we were looking at a lot of the traffic stuff, um, I got from Mass DOT a lot of their, um, they do quite regularly do traffic surveys and we're able to see the um, show an increase in traffic on Route 1, Route 140, Route 106, um, all the different roads that lead through Foxborough and ultimately could take somebody to the casino. Um, the two biggest sources of information that we were able to pull from and use directly in the grant application, and I'll show that as I move forward, but um, Christopher Bruce, who's a college uh, professor in Massachusetts, he does a report, I think every year for the Gaming Commission. Um, that's the link. I don't think, you could probably take a picture of it if you need to or um, write it down, but that's the link. If you search Christopher Bruce Mass Gaming Report on Google, it's gonna come right up. 
and that report's very detailed. It talks about every casino, every impact community. So all the communities like Foxborough that we don't have the casino here, but years ago we signed on the impact agreement saying, hey, there could be an impact because there's a casino nearby. Uh, and he really breaks it down. And two years ago, it was mainly, hey, Foxborough's seeing more traffic and more traffic accidents. Uh, last year it was, hey, there's been a spike in um, issues, calls for service, arrests, crimes reported, that sort of thing, at hotels. Uh, we have, I think, eight hotels in town. I think Plainville has one. And our hotels, most of them are tied to a certain NFL stadium. So it's a bit of a draw. And uh, people come to the area and often they stay here, even though they may go to the casino at some point in their stay. Um, we're housing them here. And it's also a draw to people doing unsavory things, too, because there's a target audience for them here. People here to gamble, people here to go to a football game or a concert, that sort of thing. So his, his report is unbelievable. You can go in there and literally just copy and paste into certain sections of the grant application talking about the impact. And when challenged on this or questioned on it or asked to elaborate, uh, if you are by the Gaming Commission, it's very easy to go back and say, your expert said this is the problem. And it really just, it seals the case for you that um, you've correlated back to the casino, whatever the issue is you're looking for funding for. Uh, there's also another report, it was called the uh, Problem Gaming and Impact Reports. Um, and that one talks uh, you know, a little bit about correlations to alcohol and drugs and uh, problem gambling and the amount of problem gambling that's going on. And um, didn't really help us with a great connection to Foxborough, but just talked about the things that go on, the negative things that go on at a casino. And when the casino is two miles away, the people have to come from somewhere to get there. So that was a, um, that was a easy thing for us. Um, next slide. So, and just kind of some points in case there's people out there who haven't had good success with the, um, the gaming grants, um, just some basic information of um, use the statistics that are available to your advantage. Um, you know, in our case, Plain Ridge has been here about eight years. And over the past eight years until COVID, we were basically, we could show an increase every year in traffic and crime and in virtually everything. Now, of course, COVID went and screwed that all up. Uh, I don't know what this year is going to look like because obviously uh, 20 and 21, uh, things got real weird. People were at home, there was less traffic, that sort of thing. But it seems to be on the rebound here now. Um, my next bullet point of using experiences, even if anecdotal, comes from the hotel issues. Uh, when we were talking about this, um, we talked about some arrests and some encounters with people at some of the hotels who, you know, in conversation with these people, it came up that, oh, we were at Plain Ridge, we're coming from Plain Ridge, and it's three in the morning, and we're back at the hotel, and there's a big brawl or something breaks out, and, you know, and someone is, is just happens to provide us that information that they were there. Um, and, and that was something that we were able to, you know, it's hard to quantify, but uh, people of our folks have heard it in the field and we were able to share that with the commission. So they realized that, oh, that is true. These people actually are spending the night, you know, down the street and, you know, sometimes late at night, bad things happen. Um, and obviously like uh, Joe and Mary and everyone else here talked about making a connection back to the casino is important. Um, it, really it's imperative uh, in our case. Um, most of what we've uh, had luck with has been the traffic stuff, uh, drugs, alcohol, the human trafficking piece, uh, making a connection that these problems or these issues relate to uh, a 24 hour business that, you know, hosts people all hours of the night, people who may engage in other types of behaviors uh, before or after coming or going from that business. Um, and then I, a couple of other key points show that this is something you need, not just something you want. Uh, speak to the long-term benefits. Uh, don't be greedy. I got a little greedy last year. I, I put in for about 240000 I got 80000 um, And then obviously show a benefit to the casino. And some of this, I, I saw an application a few years ago that I think was rejected. And it was some, some public safety agency asking for a piece of equipment. And it was very briefly worded saying, hey, this thing's old and has high mileage. Well, it, you needed to show more than that. Um, so that was, uh, next slide. Yeah. And Ken, just, if I could just add in, um, I think what, you know, where you said that, that don't be greedy. Um, I think one of the things that the commission looks at is 
especially uh, in more in the surrounding communities is, you know, what percentage of this is due to the casino as opposed to other things. In Foxborough's case, where you do have this, the stadium and, and Patriot Place and some other things, we had to look at sort of what was the commission's fair share of that cost. You, know, you would have some of these issues regardless of whether there was a casino or not. It's just that the casino is contributing to them. And then, you know, we have to figure out what's kind of a fair share. Yeah, and Foxborough's a unique situation. Obviously, we have the, you know, we have the big venue. And I think Plainville could probably argue that our big venue brings more trouble to them than their little venue brings to us. Um, but combined, Foxborough, Rentham, Plainville, Mansfield, this area right here, uh, you know, Mansfield has the, the Xfinity Center. So there are a lot of things that draw people out here. And the casino is just kind of the icing on the cake to, that we find to some of the people that come out and they're here for a concert, they're here for a show, they're here for a night of drinking. And oh, hey, there's a casino down the street. So um, it, it certainly helps in the, um, uh, in the application. I, I apologize, this is a terrible PowerPoint slide, a lot of verbiage, but these are just some quotations from the Christopher Bruce report that I inserted directly into our gaming application. Um, and for example, you know, one of the questions was talking about, you know, tell us about the, you know, the impact to your community. And I, I stated, hey, we have an impact of traffic. And here's the gaming commission's experts saying the types of calls for service to increase are those highly correlated with the number of cars and visitors to community, such as traffic issues, lost property, suspicious activity. Um, and then further down in 2019, the same uh, different report, he says that um, Foxborough hotspots seem to be around the stadium and not on routes to Plainville Park Casino. And that was one where I had to go in and kind of argue my point that the stadium is on the only route to Plain Ridge Park Casino. It's on Route 1, where the casino is. So, um, it, you know, it, the reports help. They can hurt. But in this was a case where I disagreed with uh, something in there and I, I put it in. Uh, just to kind of make our point that, hey, the, the, the two buildings are two and a half miles apart on the same road. There's, there's a draw between the two. Uh, next slide. Uh, and this is also some um, of note in the highlighted section. Uh, again, Christopher Bruce's report on uh, you know, crime and impact to the communities. He shows that he saw a spike in activity at Foxborough hotels. Now, you know, is that spike going to drop with COVID? Who knows? Is the spike due to the casino? Who knows? Is it due to, who knows what it's due to, but we we're able to correlate that, you know, the, the expert analyst hired by the Gaming Commission, he's recognizing there's an increase over the past number of years um, with problems at the hotel. And what I also would highlight down the bottom, the 120% is in the five years since Plain Ridge had opened, uh, police reports have gone up 120% at the hotels. So there's certainly some correlation. Is all 120% Plain Ridge Park? Absolutely not. But some percentage of it probably is. Um, next slide. I apologize, this got cut off a little bit, but so this was an excerpt from the actual application, one of the boxes that, uh, I think it's in PDF form, you have to fill it in. And it's asking for documentation or evidence uh, to support the gaming facility caused the impact. And I cited uh, in proper college format, I hope, uh, two of Bruce's uh, reports. And then it goes on to, I, I make the citation of the actual report, then I put the those blurbs you saw previously or the highlighted of what he said. Uh, next slide. And then this is the same thing. Uh, this talks about the host agreement impact. I didn't have that. I didn't work in Foxborough back when they originally signed the host agreement a number of years ago. I had to go digging around and, uh, and get it. And the uh, one sentence excerpt that got us a whole bunch of money a couple of years ago was that um, right there under box A, describe excerpts from relative uh, sections of your host agreement, is the project will increase traffic related accidents on the roads of the town. And that helped us to get um, uh, the traffic equipment, the cones, the truck, um, things like that. And um, and then, you know, please explain how this was anticipated or not anticipated, you know, and we explained, hey, it was anticipated, but then we've, um, you know, can show stats over the past number of years since Plain Ridge opened, showing the increase in accidents, um, 
in motor vehicle complaints and drunk driving, things of that nature. Uh, next slide. Here's my contact info. If anyone that's uh, doing this on the public safety side, either police or fire has any questions or wants to see what I've sent in the past couple of years, I'm happy to share it to you. If you, it's my work cell phone, you can give me a call or a text or shoot me an email. And um, one thing I will say about training, um, again, keep it broad because we don't know what topics are going to get um, cut in and cut out, you know, between the state and MPTC and all the private vendors next year. Uh, but the gaming commission was good to deal with because on our end, we have a pretty good training budget. Uh, didn't have an issue necessarily paying for the cost of training for the two or $300 a class might cost. But uh, one thing I explained to the commission was the killer for us is the we're short staffed, probably like everyone else. And for us, it's the overtime replacement. We're basically body for body. If I send an officer to training, um, it may not cost me overtime to send them. I can send them in lieu of their shift, but it's going to cost me to backfill them. So I could send officers to a free training class, but it's still going to cost us money in that backfill overtime to replace them to actually get them trained. And uh, that was approved as part of our grant application that we could use the money to backfill uh, when people were going to these approved um, classes. So like I said, the gaming commission has been good to deal with, pretty easy to deal with. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions or, you know, help anyone uh, if I can uh, get yourself awarded some money. Just don't take it all because I need some this year too. <laughs> well, Ken, you did a great job. We're having several people ask for copies of your PowerPoint. So uh, good job. Um, do have a couple of questions for you guys. How are you able to show the increases while accounting for traffic decreases related to the pandemic, 18 month or so stretch? Did you only use data from the time period of casino opening to start of pandemic? So uh, last year's application was due, I think, December of 20, January 21-ish. So at that point, we were in the first seven or eight months of COVID when I wrote it. So at that point, the latest information we were working with were the 2019 studies because this grant, you know, the grant was written in 2020. So I assume that um, if you guys hired Mr. Bruce again or whoever to do the similar studies this year, we're going to see those different numbers because now, you know, at the end of 21, we're going to be writing the grant. We're going to have that full year of 2020 and those studies that came out, you know, this past spring, summer, that sort of thing. So that's a little bit of the unknown for us on the traffic end of things. And we know on the police end, we know the calls for service declined. We know arrests, things like that declined. Um, so that's just going to be a unique challenge to this year. But overall, for us, I think we still look at the broad picture of, hey, since Plain Ridge run in, here's what we've seen. And I would probably write this year's to account for, you know, no one could expect there was going to be something keeping everyone home for eight months. Okay, thank you. Um, I just want to let the audience know um, if you, uh, when you go into the combis, we have downloaded our PowerPoint to the application uh, on combis, and uh, Ken's PowerPoint is incorporated in our PowerPoint. Um, but also, if there's any other additional information you're going to want, just feel free to give us a call or send us an email, and we're happy to provide whatever we can. And Mary, the PowerPoint, is that going up on our website as well? Oh, yes. Yes. After today, we were going to load it up on the PowerPoint, on the website, too. Yeah. Great. Great. Okay. Any other further questions there, Mary, for, for Ken? No. Well, thank you, Ken. Uh, appreciate your time and, uh, and putting this together. Uh, great information for everyone, I think. Um, so next up, we have the City of Lynn. They're going to talk about, they've had a few grants with us. Um, they're going to talk, uh, Jamie Marsh is the Director of uh, Community Development there. Uh, uh, Jamie doesn't have a PowerPoint for us, so I'm going to stop sharing so everybody can, can see him. Uh, well, we're a little challenged here at City Hall today. I'm on an old HP and I have no video as well. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you right. fine. Yep. <laughs> so uh, thanks, Joe, and thanks for having us. We're happy to uh, participate here uh, on behalf of the City of Lynn. Thank you. We just wanted to give a brief overview of the grants that we've received here in the City of Lynn and give uh, prospective applicants an idea of what they might apply for. 
and some insights into our own experiences uh, applying for these grants, we're not really gonna focus on one uh, particular grant. So here in Lynn, uh, we've been fortunate to have received five grants, four of which were based on mitigating increased traffic as a result of the construction and operation of Encore. Um, our first grant was a $100,000 transportation planning grant, which we utilized to study streamlining ferry service from Lynn to Boston. Our application was based on mitigating increased traffic along Route 1A, I think everybody knows that as uh, the Linway in Lynn, getting people off the road and onto alternative means of transportation. Um, the study helped make the case for bringing ferry service back to the city. Interestingly enough, it was also used to advocate for a $2.2 million MassWorks grant, which is slated to start this spring. I bring that up because, uh, as Joe mentioned, these grants are really seed money. Um, and there always seem to be jump-starting, uh, they used to jump-start projects, but also jump-starting other projects and, and really lead, for us at least, really lead to additional funding all the time. Um, our second grant was a $100,000 planning grant and we utilize uh, for a citywide study of all Lynn's traffic signal equipment. Literally over 80 uh, different intersections throughout the city were studied. Like the first grant, we made the case that traffic congestion within the city had been exacerbated by the operation of the casino. Uh, upon completion of the study, I'm happy to state, as I mentioned, the city itself budgeted funds to begin the actual repairs of the sig signals. Uh, all aimed at streamlining traffic operations through the city of Lynn and mitigating casino-related impacts. The third and fourth grants, both transportation planning grants totaling $300,000, were utilized to jumpstart a $37 million TIP project in the city of Lynn along Western Ave. Again, making the case that congestion had increased as a result of Encore operations. For this grant, I can really say without hesitation that to avoid the mitigation funds, we wouldn't have been able to get this project after, off the ground. Uh, today, it's the highest scoring transportation project being considered by the Boston MPO for full funding. And the city has also just budgeted $7 million for further design and engineering. Uh, it, it really, it just wouldn't have happened without this initial seed money from the grant. Um, so with these initial four grants, the real challenge for us was proving harm or proving impact. I think as communities, we all know we're impacted, whether it's small or large, but um, proving it's the tough part. Um, the most recent grant we received, the one we're currently working on, is being utilized to create a city marketing plan. Unlike the previous grants that were based on transportation-related impacts, this grant is based on lost revenue to the city as a result of Encore getting into the live entertainment business. And in, in general, you know, attracting visitors away from Lynn uh, to the casino. The city, um, through my office, runs a 2,000 seat auditorium, and we're now seem to be competing against the casino for shows. We made the case to the, um, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the commission that every time the casino books a show that may have gone to the Lynn Auditorium, it results in thousands of dollars in lost ticket revenue, not only to Lynn Auditorium, but also the lost economic spinoff to the city itself. Uh, in restaurants and other retail out outlets before and after shows, not to mention lost jobs for bartenders, ushers, ticket takers, mail stacks. It has a huge impact. And the issue uh, we see it is buying power. Our municipal budgets are no match for the casino's buying power when it comes to purchasing and advertising shows or advertising casino uh, as a destination itself. They have a distinct advantage with built-in revenue streams, built-in audiences, and deep pockets. We're just unable to compete uh, against them, and in a larger sense, compete for tourists uh, and their disposable income without you know, advertising funding. Um, we hope the $100,000 in funding we received uh, for showcasing the city in and around Encore, which we, we plan to, to advertise, uh, if not in Encore, around Encore, will help to level the playing field a bit and attract people back to communities like Lynn uh, and in amenities like the Lynn Auditorium. Um, so those are snapshots of the five grants we received here in Lynn. Joe, I have to say, we're happy to hear that the burden of uh, quantifying impacts being relaxed because again, from my experience, that's the biggest hurdle to overcome in applying for these uh, planning grants. Uh, I think we all know we're impacted. 
in a small way or a large way. It's just hard to prove sometimes. So again, uh, on behalf of the city, thanks for having us participate. Um, Joe, Mary, the commission have been wonderful to work with, always answering questions. Uh, we really appreciate these grants. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, appreciate those kind words. And, um, you know, I think that was, you know, one of the messages that we heard from many of our applicants, you know, that, that, um, and our advisory committees that trying to quantify the impacts was, uh, was really, uh, causing difficulties for communities. So we really did try to address that at least in the, um, community planning category, at least for this year. So Mary, do we have any questions for Jamie? No, I don't see any. Okay. Um, well, thanks again. Um, so I will go back to, to sharing our screen and Mary, I'll uh, turn this over to you for, uh, for our process for obtaining grant funds. And it looks like we are starting to run a little short on time. So we yeah. really have to... Uh, I'll speed it up. <laughs> Um, before I jump into uh, the specifics of the application and naming your RFR, I do want to suggest a couple of things. And it would be, uh, one, the first step I would suggest would be to read the 2022 guidelines. They are um, on their Appendix A of the RFR, and that provides a lot of the details uh, that you've been asking about. Um, and so for clarification, I would suggest her, that being done first. The second task would be to read the instructions for the type of grant that you're going to apply for. There are uh, a lot of instructions on the uh, COMBI's RFR. Um, you just need to find the type of grant you're looking for and uh, those instructions are there. Um, when you're filling out your application, it, we would greatly appreciate it if you would not fill the whole application as see the attached. We would like you to use the application at, is, as it is intended, and that is to fill in the blocks. And then if you have attachments, then say, then you may have attachments at the back end of the application but we really would like you to use the form as, uh, as it's presented. Now, on to naming your RFR submission. So the uh, Gaming Commission has started a database, and with this database, we need um, entities to, be, to uh, submit the same type of naming sequence for their application when they save it to send it to us. Um, on this, you'll see the second line, RFR submission, entity type year project name. And then I just did a random Everett SI. SI stands for the specific impact. 22 is the year. Broadway was the uh, description that was on page one. So for this, um, for saving your RFR submission, we would like you to use this naming sequence and leave it to uh, 20 characters. Um, for your attachments, if you could copy what you did in the first and just put ATT1 and go that way, that would be great. Uh, let's see, the, the reason this, um, in, that uh, coding is important is that this is also going to coincide with the state contract, which will be signed when the grant is signed. And uh, it is a requirement of the uh, MARS ID. This is basically what this is going to be is the MARS ID. All right. Ne um, this is the abbreviations so that you'd see all the different types of uh, abbreviations available. Okay, next. This year on the first page of the application is a slot for the vendor code. The vendor codes are assigned to the municipalities and each municipality only has one person that is able to uh, submit these RFRs. 
If you have any questions regarding combis or, or sending in your uh, application, please use the combis. Either send them an email or give them a call. Um, because and they will be able to help you. We um, we don't deal with the combis technology. Only combis does. Next, uh, impact description. The most critical factor in these applications is to be sure the impact is attributable to the casino. Um, as we've shown earlier, there's uh, many ways to to determine these impacts. Here is a list of some of the ways you can show the impacts or do some research to, um, to uh, make sure that it's attributable to the casino. Next. Addressing the impacts. Um, having a proposed scope, budget, and timeline is very helpful in the analysis of the application. Additionally, a scope, budget, and timeline is required as uh, in the grants. So in order to release funding, the commission staff reviews and approves the scope, budget, and timeline prior to the releasing of any funding. And just as a side note, we would appreciate you rounding figures up to the nearest hundred. We do not need to know that it's $83.43. Um, MGC strongly encourages reaching out to the licensee regarding their applications. It could be that the licensees already have done research in something that you're considering applying for. So a uh, call to them, they're very helpful, um, and we, we want to see you reach out to the licensees. Yeah, and Mary, just, uh, just to add in on that, mm -hmm. I know last year, we did have a few folks uh, say to us that uh, you know they really weren't able to get through to the licensees, you know, during the pandemic and so on. I know uh, last year hopefully was uh, an anomaly, uh, but yeah, we, we certainly would like, especially if it's something where you're trying to work with the licensee to attract uh, customers or so on to your businesses, um, having some uh, uh, input from the licensee would be great. Yep. Yep. Okay, consultation with regional planning authority. This section addresses the regional outfit, out, outreach. Consultation with regional planning authority is required. Um, and we like to hear about what communications you've had with the, our, our, uh, the regional planning authority and any other collaborative partners. Um, there have been a number of studies commissioned by the MGC and the regional planning agencies, which are available on the commission's website, which uh, will help with uh, your development of your application. Uh, you would be amazed at the amount of the scope of the information available to communities through the regional planning agencies. So we strongly again encourage you to do that. Uh, next. The administration of funds. This section is very important as the person who is responsible for the administration of funds may be also be the person who needs to submit a quarterly report and the annual report. If they are not listed on the first page of the application, which is the basic data of the, of the grant, please uh, fill in their name here so that we have them on our database. Next, where should the application be sent? Um, it should be sent through combis. Um, as uh, in the event that an entity is unable to file an application due to technical problems with combis, we need to receive the application at least by January 30th. The reason being, we have to upload any application that cannot go through combis, and we have to show combis that indeed we did receive the application by the due date. So the, the RFR closes on the 31st, and that is why uh, we're saying January 30 for that particular 
matter, but we don't anticipate there being any problems. But of course, if you do have a problem, please let us know as soon as possible. Next. Okay, and I think Mary, also that bottom bullet, uh, you know, combis, the, the, the combis folks are the specialists in combis, we are not. Right. Um, so if there's technical issues with combis itself, you really do need to contact them. I mean, you could contact us, but we're not sure that we'll be able to give you the right answer to all of those questions. Okay. All right. Um, we did get a couple of questions. Uh, can you provide updated community liaison contacts for the licensees or tell them that they have to have someone whose job it is to speak with surrounding governments? Okay. We will note that. Um, and that's it for, okay. Uh, next, uh, application approval process. Okay, we have a review team of six staff members who review and analyze the applications. Additionally, we request evaluations from the li licensees and MassDOT. MassDOT, of course, is just all the transportation, but the licensees get all applicable applications for their review and comment. Any questions which arise are followed up with a letter to the applicant requesting further clarification. We call this a supplementary information request. The response is generally due within two weeks of the request. In some instances, the review team will request an applicant to participate in a meeting with staff. Um, these are only for clarification purposes. Um, once the uh, review team has evaluated the applications, the applications then go before the commission for a vote. Last year applications were reviewed by type of application, which enabled us to start the review process of the applications much earlier um, because so, some funding requests come in and have specific deadlines by which they need the fund it, funding in order to run certain programs. Uh, I think that's it. Oh, and then here are our resource materials. Please check our website out, which has a large number of research studies. And as noted by the presentation by Lieutenant Fitzgerald, Foxbury used a, a host of studies to develop their application. Okay. I Okay, Question. thank you, Mary. Uh, I guess why don't we see if there's any other questions uh, sort of regarding that process. Um, have any of those, have any other questions come in? I don't see any other chats. Okay, so we've only got a couple of minutes left and I'm just, I just want to go over this real quick. Um, what we're talking about projects of regional significance. Again, one of the things, you know, we, our number of uh, applications was down last year and the, and the amount of grants was down. And, um, you know, we started thinking about, well, are there some larger projects out there that could uh, use community mitigation funds that we should be thinking about? And um, initially we said, well, should we make a new category in 2022? And um, the answer was really no, uh, we need to find out more information. So, so what we did, so what we're going to do is um, this winter, we're going to reach out to the host communities and surrounding communities and talk to them about sort of large scale projects that they have in their communities that might be eligible for some uh, community mitigation funds. And our uh, thought is that these would typically be, you know, large transportation construction or perhaps economic development projects that would require some significant dedication of financial resources to complete. Um, you know, we're think we're looking at things in the sort of the five to the tens of millions of dollars uh, on these projects, and not that the that community mitigation fund would be able to fund all of it, but maybe um, similar to the the Chelsea project, we can provide enough funds funds to bring something over the finish line. So again, we're gonna go out to the communities and ask sort of what things are available out there. I mean, there's some things we know about. You know, for instance, out in Springfield, we know that the city bought up a couple of properties right across the street from MGM and wants to see those redeveloped uh, into projects that will be 
perhaps complementary to the casino. Uh, some of these historic structures that we know are uh, extremely expensive to uh, repair uh, and to, to renovate. Um, so, you know, could community mitigation funds be used for something like that? Um, and the answer is, you know, probably yes. Um, and also, you know, the city is looking at, um, you know, the Mass Mutual Center and saying, hey, is there something we can do with the entrance to make it uh, align more with MGM? Uh, things like that. Um, in the East, we know that uh, the governor just said that um, the, the state's going to finance a uh, bridge across the Mystic River, a uh, pedestrian and bicycle uh, connection across the Mystic River uh, right near the Encore Casino. Um, but we're not sure if that includes a connection into the uh, Orange Line right there. Um, and, you know, if that uh, connection to the Orange Line needed to be funded, um, that might be a, a 10 or $12 million project unto itself. Um, so the thought here is, is that if, if we're kind of generating some surpluses on these smaller type projects, would it make sense to try to finance some of these larger projects? So as I said, we'll go out to the communities over the winter and sit down with them and, and sort of walk through what, what might be out there what could possibly be connected to the casino in some way or another, um, you know, what, what kind of costs. And then once we know at least what that tentative universe of projects is, we can then go to our advisory committees and others and talk with a, a little bit more intelligence about, um, you know, should we create this new category for these larger projects? So uh, nothing for this year uh, as far as uh, availability of funds, but something to keep your eyes on uh, potentially in the uh, next year or two. And with that, I'm looking at 2.59, which means we're um, uh, one minute uh, under our time line. So here's uh, some contact information. Um, I didn't put uh, Crystal's information here. Um, she's not uh, working on the uh, workforce grants. She's kind of transitioned out of that into something else here at the commission. Uh, but so I guess any questions with that, you can send those to Mary and we can, we can uh, route those around uh, if, if need be. Um, and then uh, I guess we'll just open it up for any, any last questions or, or, or comments or anything from anyone. Mary, do we have anything in on the I chat? I don't see anything. And I see Kathy has rejoined us here at the end. I was listening all the time. Excellent, excellent uh, two-hour session, Joe. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and I guess uh, with no other questions appearing, I guess we will um, we will adjourn. Sure, I have one. I have one comment. So, sure. hey, Bill. Bill, yeah. Um, I just want to thank everybody on the call. I want to thank everybody working together, and I. Uh, my thanks goes out to the members of the Gaming Commission. Uh, you've been very helpful to the city of Boston, so I want to thank you all, and I want to wish you a happy holiday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you thank very you, much. Bill. Thank you, Bill. All right. Well, thanks, everyone, so much for coming. Um, it looked like at the peak that I saw, we hit 100 participants, which I think is really great. Um, you know, it shows that there is interest in this program. I'm hoping that what we've done will, will help make it a little bit easier for our applicants, at least in a couple of the categories. And we're really looking forward to seeing uh, what we get in here on uh, January 29th. And, and um, I hope that we're successful in getting a lot of good applications. I also have a little bit of fear that, that we might be overly successful. Uh, <laughs> and if that's the case, I guess that's good too. Um, but anyway, thanks again, and uh, we look forward to hearing from all of you, uh, um, uh, getting applications in at the end of January, and happy holidays. Okay, thank you. Thanks, bye-bye.